Um, I am really honored and excited to be joined by so many great leaders of the reproductive rights advocacy community, and I'm going to let them go first. I'll wrap up because we're here for a supremely important occasion as we go into a vote literally this week on the Women's Health Protection Act. Just so everybody understands, I first introduced the Women's Health Protective Act in 2013. In that year, 2013, the Women's Health Protection Act was thought to be totally unnecessary. I had to respond to questions about why we were even introducing it at that moment, because the possibility of overturning Roe v. Wade seems like some very distant nightmare. And now the nightmare is real. Now the storm has hit us. And the Women's Health Protection Act will be voted on this week in the United States Senate. The bill that I introduced in 2013, thought to be completely unnecessary, is now absolutely vital. And we're going to put every single senator on record. Every one of us will vote this week on whether to preserve a woman's right to choose when and whether to become pregnant into our federal statute because we can no longer count on the United States Supreme Court. In fact, the United States Supreme Court is about to take away reproductive rights, turn back the clock, not to the 1950s, but to the 1850s, literally, when abortion was banned. And the prospect of a criminal prohibition is real and present because the minority leader, Mitch McConnell, has said that he favors a ban. And that kind of criminal prohibition on abortion or reproductive rights and women's health care is a real and imminent prospect. And the Women's Health Protection Act is vitally necessary now. So uh, we're going to have State Representative Jillian Gilchrist, State Representative Amy Berger-Giraldo, Amanda Skinner, President and CEO of Planned Parenthood, Claudine Constant of the ACLU, Liz Gustafson of Pro-Choice Connecticut, she's State Director, Janie Woods Weber, Executive Director of Quelp. Uh, I hope you can remember that order, uh, but I'll call on you anyway if, if we get confused. So uh, these women leaders are the ones making a difference, literally making a difference for all of us at this momentous time in history. And I want to thank them for their advocacy, their courage and strength, and uh, I'm very proud to introduce, first of all, uh, Representative Gilchrist of West Hartford. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Um, I'm Jillian Gilchrist, State Representative for the 18th District in West Hartford, and I truly do want to thank you uh, for just being a champion on reproductive rights uh, for years. And as you mentioned, introducing that bill back in 2013 when people questioned why, um, and now we unfortunately are living in quite fear. Um, Many of us anticipated uh, that the Supreme Court would overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, but as of last week, with the leaked opinion, we know this decision is imminent. And with this decision, individuals across this country's lives are going to be put in danger. This opinion completely disregards the experience of whether or not someone wants to become pregnant. In all my time working on reproductive rights issues, I have never met a woman who has the same experience of why they chose abortion. Everyone's experience is unique, and the Supreme Court is completely disregarding that 
and pu putting people's lives in danger. I am proud to be co-chair of the Reproductive Rights Caucus here at the Connecticut General Assembly, where just last week we passed and the governor signed into law the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act, which expands Connecticut's abortion law, expanding access for individuals across the state by allowing advanced practitioners to provide abortion care, and additionally, putting in protections for folks who are seeking abortions here in the state and for our providers, knowing that the Supreme Court would likely overturn Roe v. Wade. But even though I'm proud of what we're doing here in the state of Connecticut, I'm horrified about what is about to happen across this country. We know that if Roe is overturned, 26 states will immediately be able to ban abortion. Again, putting people's lives at risk. We've been here before in this country. We know that banning abortion doesn't stop the need for abortion. The Supreme Court and that opinion that was leaked is completely full of sexism. It completely denies the experiences of folks living day in and day out. And that's why I'm so proud once again of Senator Blumenthal for leading the charge on the Women's Health Protection Act. We need this now more than ever they need to take this vote and they need to pass this because, I keep saying it, but people's lives are in jeopardy. Uh, for those of us who've been fighting this fight, we've been saying we needed a bill like this for years. But in these final weeks before the Supreme Court makes their decision, we need it now more than ever. And so I stand with the senator and I, I urge all of the senators um, in our state government to do the right thing and pass the Women's Health Protection Act. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Amy. Thank you, Senator. My name is Amy Berger Gervallo. I'm state representative in the 111th, which is Ridgefield. And um, I am also an abortion storyteller. And the first time that I spoke about the abortion that I had when I was 18 years old was in a public health committee meeting as a response to some of the rhetoric that was coming at us from uh, the opposition, I felt it was, without thinking, I felt it was important to share what my perspective was and what the reality was. And after I spoke, um, it was an extraordinarily emotional moment for me and one that made me feel a little bit alone. We were on Zoom meetings, we weren't in, in a space where I could hug my colleagues, many of whom were standing behind me. There wasn't an opportunity to be comforted. And so I turned off my camera and I texted my two dearest friends. And I told them for the very first time about my abortion and I told them that I had just spoken publicly to I didn't know how many people about that abortion. And these are women who I have known collectively for 30 years between the two of them, and both of them shared with me in that moment that they had also had abortions. We had never discussed it. We had never even thought about discussing it with one another. And in that moment, we created space for one another, and we created space for others. Since that moment, I have spoken about it publicly a number of times, and I have spoken to so many women who have come forward to me to tell me their story for the first time. All that I ask is that everybody here understand that someone you love has had an abortion. There are stories that may never be told, but if we create space for others to be able to do that, if we put ourselves in that position, it may feel extraordinarily vulnerable, it may um, it may even trigger some emotions that maybe you weren't ready to touch in with, but you're creating that space and making it safer for everyone. And that is our goal, is to help everybody to understand that the stigma behind abortion is unnecessary, that it is coming from a rhetoric that is not here to support you, it is here to stop you because of the fear that is coming from the other side. So stand tall and know that you have an incredible group of people, whether they're literally standing behind you or they're standing out there somewhere else, you have people who will support you. 
tell your story, and listen when someone wants to tell you theirs. Thank you so much, Senator, for the work that you're doing, and I will give you Amanda. Good morning. I'm Amanda Skinner, President and Chief Executive Officer of Planned Parenthood of Southern New England. I'm proud to be here today alongside Senator Blumenthal, whose tireless work in advocacy has made Connecticut a leader in protecting and advancing reproductive health and rights. Just a week ago, we learned that the Supreme Court is ready to throw out almost 50 years of legal precedent and take away the constitutional right to abortion. This outcome is as dangerous as it is unprecedented. It will open the floodgates for states across the country to ban abortion. And what's clear from Justice Alito's opinion is that nothing is safe. They are coming for birth control, marriage equality. They are coming for everything. They want to turn back the clock not just 50 years, but hundreds of years. The court, which is now dominated by justices who are hostile to our freedoms, has failed this country. Now more than ever, it is critical for the United States Senate to pass the Women's Health Protection Act and protect access to safe, legal abortion across the country. This critical legislation would protect the right to abortion throughout the United States and guard against the dangerous abortion bans being pushed forward by state politicians. The House has already passed this critical legislation, and again, we thank Connecticut House members for their vote in support. Thank you again, Senator Blumenthal, for introducing it, and we are grateful for your unwavering commitment and leadership. Here in Connecticut, our state lawmakers are carrying on Senator Blumenthal's legacy of championing reproductive rights, and we are so grateful for our legislative champions, including those who are standing here with us today. We are thrilled that Governor Lamont signed the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act into law last week, the most significant abortion legislation passed by the Connecticut General Assembly since Connecticut codified the protections of Roe versus Wade into state law in 1990. While anti-abortion politicians across the country are pushing through increasingly extreme and harmful abortion bans, Connecticut is once again leading the fight for reproductive freedom in our country. As we do that, we must also continue to listen and to learn. We heard the powerful words shared by black women in the General Assembly this session about the harm done to the health and lives of generations of black women by the reproductive rights movement, including Planned Parenthood, and the medical field. We acknowledge these injustices as we strive to correct them. As a nurse and as a midwife, I am outraged when politicians put their beliefs before a patient's personal decisions about their health, their body, and their future. All people should be trusted to make the reproductive health care decisions that are best for them, including abortion, on their timeline and with the resources and support that they need. All decisions to have an abortion are unique individual and deserve respect. We have heard heartbreaking stories from patients from the many states enacting abortion bans who are arriving at clinics only to discover that they are too late to have an abortion, sometimes by a matter of days or hours. These abortion bans disproportionately harm black and Latino people, people with low incomes, immigrants, and people in rural areas who already face immense barriers to accessing health care. These bans are misogynistic, racist, transphobic and cruel, and there is no place for them anywhere in our country. That is why we need the Senate to pass the Women's Health Protection Act, so that no matter where you live, no matter who you are, and no matter who you love, you will have the right to access safe, high-quality health care, including abortion care. Planned Parenthood will not give up. Abortion is still legal, our doors are open, and we will continue to fight like hell to demand that everyone has the freedom and power to control their own bodies, decisions, and lives without shame, stigma, and political interference. It is beyond time for the United States to recognize that abortion is health care and health care is a human right. Thank you, and I am turning it to Claudine. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Claudine Constant. I am the Public Policy and Advocacy Director at the ACLU of Connecticut. Um, I'm going to keep it short. Every time I have an opportunity to step up to the microphone regarding 
abortion care, health care, anything like that. I think it's important to remind people that abortion care is health care, as we just heard Amanda say. Um, but also, abortion care and health care need to be intersectional in nature. It is critical for us to remember that if we are going to force femmes into giving birth, it is incum incumbent upon our people in leadership Senator Blumenthal, um, uh, to make sure that there are other protections in place. What, what happens when we ban abortion care is that we are then forcing FEMS to engage in a system uh, in the United States that has the highest maternal morta mortality rate in the world. We're asking people to engage in systems that don't take care of people, don't provide economic relief, don't provide quality housing, don't provide quality jobs. And so anytime that I have an opportunity opportunity to be here. I want to remind folks that abortion care is health care, health care is a human right, and also people deserve an opportunity to thrive. And it's not only about providing quality access to health care, it is about providing quality access to all of the systems that make a person be able to live their best lives. Banning abortion care and banning access to a needed uh, Health care protection is also sentencing to sentencing people to a death sentence. Essentially, we are asking people to engage in systems that don't take care of them, and it's irresponsible at best. So I encourage our uh, federal leadership to make sure that we're thinking about abortion care and health care holistically, and we're thinking about the whole person, not just a person's uterus. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz Gustafson, and I am the State Director of Pro-Choice Connecticut. Abortion access is one of several fundamental rights that have been under attack in the U.S. for years, including our right to vote, racial justice, LGBTQ plus rights, and a host of others that are intertwined with our right to liberty and privacy in which Roe v. Wade was founded. Abortion bans are systemic discrimination and action and the impact of this decision will be profoundly harmful. And the decision I am talking about is the leaked SCOTUS opinion and not taking federal action. The impacts of this decision will fall hardest on the people who already face discriminatory obstacles to accessing healthcare, particularly black, indigenous, and other people of color, people with disabilities, young people, undocumented people, and folks working to make ends meet. We must pursue proactive protections beyond the courts by supporting providers, patients, abortion funds, and clinics on the ground, and advancing state protections through laws such as the Reproductive Freedom Defense Act, signed by Governor Lamont last week, and federal protections such as the Women's Health Protection Act, thank you, the EACH Act, and the elimination of the Hyde Amendment from the budget. We should all be able to make the personal health care decisions that impact our lives, health, and futures, and be surrounded by the people that we love and in the communities that we call home. My abortion in 2018 allowed me to continue being the author of my own story. And I refuse to let anti-choice extremists manipulate my narrative. I am deeply grateful for the access to abortion that I had and to the compassionate care that I received at Planned Parenthood. And to anyone watching this at home who has had an abortion or needs access to abortion, you are loved, your reason is the right reason, and there is a whole community here fighting for you. And we will keep fighting until every person, no matter where we live, how much money we make, or what we look like, has the freedom to make our own decisions about our lives and our future. Thank you. Um, I'm honored to stand here with Senator Blumenthal, and I'm honored to be a citizen of our state of Connecticut, uh, where uh, we had the vision to create the protections that could not be taken away. But we cannot be relaxing at any point, because what we have seen is that things are turning back in the wrong direction. We have recognized uh, that it's a matter of time. Um, the 
uh, Supreme Court may make a decision that's going to bring us 49 years back or 50 years back. Um, what the results are going to be the safety and it's going to result in deaths and the choices will be taken away. Um, this was because of the wisdom of Senator Blumenthal that as a state of Connecticut we have been way ahead of the curve. Now it's a time for us to have the same vision uh, spread in the entire country and, and, and we need a federal law for the protections. Uh, we will need to codify the laws so that we cannot have uh, activist Supreme Court make decisions and we will need to make sure that the other protections that we have always taken for granted in the last many years are also protected. As a uh, acting chair of the Public Health Committee, I'm honored to be part of the bill with a team of the legislators who have put this forward to protect our citizens, the women in our state of Connecticut, uh, but we are not going to stop. We will continue to work together to make sure that we protect everyone, including the individuals that we are worried about that the Supreme Court will target going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Janae Woods Weber, Executive Director of Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund, also known as QUELF. We advocate for women and girls in Connecticut by supporting the creation of policies that advance women's economic security and promote gender equity. QUELF is a proud, committed member of the Connecticut Coalition for Choice because we know that we will never achieve gender equity and economic security without full reproductive freedom for everyone, and especially for women of color and women with low income. At Quelf, we pay particular attention to the way sexism and racism intertwine, and we are deeply concerned by the leak of the draft Roe v. Wade opinion and the possible consequences for women, but especially for women of color. Controlling pregnant people's bodies has always been a key component of our patriarchal culture, especially when used to control, regulate, and dehumanize black and brown women's bodies. The Reproductive Freedom Defense Act has been signed into law in Connecticut, but our work protecting access to abortion is not done. It's not enough for us, as residents of Connecticut, to watch from the safe harbor of our state while abortion restrictions and bans are pushed onto our neighbors' bodies in other states. We need the Women's Health Protection Act to become federal law. We cannot rely on only elected officials to protect access to abortion in Connecticut and across our country. This is work for all of us, no matter where we live and no matter our own gender identity. Protecting our right to abortion is not just a women's issue. We need to be loud and persistent so that everybody knows that abortion is normal and it's also a very safe procedure under the care of a medical professional. One in four people who identify as women will have an abortion by their mid-40s. And many of those women are already mothers who have children. People of every background, every ethnicity and race, every income level have abortions. What is true, though, is that denying people their right to medical care, which is what an abortion is, will impact not all people the same. Young people, people of color, people with low income, and people in rural areas will be denied access to safe abortions. We need the Women's Health Protection Act to become federal law. We need the United States to be a place where abortion is free from unnecessary barriers, especially medical barriers or legal barriers. We need to make sure that our young people grow up knowing that getting an abortion for any reason they want to or need to is not shameful or abnormal, and it doesn't need to be a secret that we whisper about behind closed doors. Equitable and timely access to legally protected, destigmatized abortion care is a human right. It's a woman's right. It's every person's right. The majority of people in our country agree. So our federal laws should then reflect that as a country, we the people believe that upholding access to safe and legal abortion care is an American value, and we should pass the Women's Health Protection Act. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I, I really want to, again, thank the advocates who are here uh, and uh, really thank the governor, Governor Lamont, uh, all of our state legislature for putting Connecticut at the forefront. Thank you, Jillian, for your very, very hard work on the caucus. Uh, Connecticut's at the forefront in providing a safe harbor. 
But no place is safe in America if the United States Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. Make no mistake, the United States Congress can override Connecticut's protective law. It's called federal preemption. A ban on reproductive health services will override Connecticut's law and take away those rights that many in Connecticut take for granted. And that's why we need, in our federal statute, a law that preserves and protects reproductive rights. Now, I have a word to the men of Connecticut. You don't get to sit this one out. To the men of Connecticut, you don't get to sit this one out with the idea that it doesn't affect you. Someone you love, certainly someone you know, has had an abortion when they chose to do it and is better for it. And the United States Supreme Court is about to take away that right. It affects all of us, every one of us. And the implications of overturning Roe v. Wade will affect privacy rights for all of us as well. If the right of privacy under Roe v. Wade is eviscerated, as the Alito draft opinion would do, there is no protection for private health care data. There is no protection for pregnancy screenings or other health care for all of us. And the sweeping implications of the United States Supreme Court saying, established precedent doesn't mean anything anymore is truly frightening. It's a break the glass moment for American democracy. That is no exaggeration. So I'm proud to stand here on the verge of flying down to Washington, D.C. for this historic vote this week. And I want to be very blunt. It's an uphill fight. It's a difficult battle. We may, may not prevail, but every senator will be on record. Every senator will have to vote on the Women's Health Protection Act, which I introduced at a time when everybody thought we could take it for granted that women would have reproductive rights in America. Not so anymore. And every senator will be held accountable many this November. Reproductive rights will be on the ballot, not only for the one in four women who've had abortions, but for all women, all people in America. Reproductive rights will be on the ballot this November, and it will be there on a way that should ignite the energy and fury of Americans coming to the polls. So I am uh, really honored to be here with all of you, and thank you for your advocacy, for your steadfastness, and we're going to continue this fight. We're not going to back down. We're not going away. We're going to fight for Connecticut, first, last, and always, but this right for Connecticut is secure only if we pass the Women's Health Protection Act. And so thank you for your hard work and all you've done. Thank you all. Any questions? Is there a reason to believe last time that um, this uh, bill came up for a vote in the Senate it, um, during the procedural vote it was uh, downturned, so we didn't actually see a vote on the actual bill. Is there any reason that um, it will go differently this time, especially the first vote will be the vote on cloture, which is a procedural vote. Um, to be very blunt, the last time we voted, the possibility of overturning Roe v. Wade was speculative, hypothetical. Now it's real. And I'm hoping that a number of my colleagues who 
decline to go forward with the debate, we'll do so this time, because the overturning of Roe v. Wade now is imminent, real, right before us. And that is uh, really scary. And I'm hoping that my colleagues are hearing from their constituents about the urgency of moving forward. What year was that first vote? Just, it was this year. Oh, was this year? Yeah. Uh, there was a procedural vote, uh, and um, Senator Manchin on our side voted against it, and all of the Republicans voted against it. But Republicans are now, at least a couple of them, are talking about voting with us, and Senator Manchin uh, as well. But we don't know for sure. Can I ask another uh, folks who have uh, spoken before? Uh, a couple of times you have mentioned about stigma, right? Um, Roe v. Wade was passed nearly 50 years ago, but we still have um, people who have been pregnant and who have had abortions. They haven't shared their stories until recently or have taken a lot of time. What do you think this new era that we're about to uh, enter in what do you feel is going to happen to that stigma? Is it is it going to worsen? Do you think there are in places where it's going to lessen? Um, um, I don't think that the stigma is going to get worse. I think this is an, a moment where folks who have had abortions are reclaiming the narrative because we refuse to accept the internalized stigma that has been perpetuated throughout society over the years. And so through storytelling and through supporting one another, either we're storytelling in public or at you know family dinner, um, that is community care. And that is of the utmost importance. And storytelling in itself is an act of resistance. And so I think we are reclaiming back our stories. Let me ask just one more question. Um, uh, New York uh, recently, today, announced that they are going to adopt some of the similar laws that Connecticut has passed with the, um, the legal protections, but also um, supported by the Attorney General James, uh, that they're going to try and create a fund, uh, a financial fund, to help people who are coming who may not have health insurance, who may not be a, a, a legal citizen, to help them get abortion care. Is that something that the Connecticut legislature has the session's over, but is that something that ever came up um, in terms of uh, the Connecticut's legislation or trying to uh, create a fund here in Connecticut to help people who don't have the means or the resources? We certainly did have those conversations. We felt that the legislation we passed was of utmost urgency. Um, but what we were told from the advocates it's a, is that there are funds available. And so I'd love for Liz to speak to what is out there that folks should be contributing to. There are, um, you know, national abortion funds um, and also some of the clinics, um, Hartford GYN Center and the Women's Centers has a fund. But also it's it's been one of our policy priorities to expand Husky coverage for undocumented immigrants of all ages. And so that's another way that we can ensure that folks have the health insurance coverage to access the care they need. And just to clarify, uh, because one of the myths about the Women's Health Protection Act is that somehow it allocates federal funds. It does not. In other words, it doesn't implicate the Hyde Amendment. All it does is say there can be no unnecessary trap laws like requirements for ultrasounds or waiting periods or admitting privileges for doctors or width of hallway requirements and it doesn't require a provider to actually perform any medical procedure that's another myth out there that somehow it requires hospitals or providers or nurses to participate in anything that's against their conscience it does not it doesn't require any provider to do anything it simply guarantees a woman's right and a provider's right to seek and provide all kinds of reproductive health services, whether it's pregnancy, screenings, or contraceptive services, or abortion. And uh, it's important to understand exactly what the Women's Health Protection Act does. And uh, 
I'm, I'm very heartened that New York is following Connecticut's example in protecting patients and providers against the kind of vigilante bounty hunters that the Texas law establishes, which is one of the great dangers because the federal constitutional protections are only against governmental intrusion. Okay, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.